You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. My name is Alan Weitz. Today, John and I will be talking about iconic photographs, pictures that typically define an era or specific point in time. We'll also be discussing the relevance of smartphones, citizen journalism, social media, shortened attention spans, and how they affect the impact of iconic images on our collective consciousness. We're fortunate to have not one, but two guests today who are well qualified to discuss iconic photography. Hal Buell is an accomplished author and a 40-year veteran photo editor with Associated Press, 25 of them as head of AP's Worldwide Photo Service. He's worked on assignment in more than 35 countries. Under his watch, the AP Picture Service won 12 Pulitzer Prizes and other national and international photography awards. He headed up a program to bring digital imaging and transmission technologies to the AP and headed a project to develop a digital picture archive that currently contains over 7 million pictures. Welcome, Hal. Olivia Laurent is editor of Lightbox, Time Magazine's photography website. Before taking his current position, he was the associate editor for the British Journal of Photography and the editor of FLTR, Filter, an independent weekly magazine about smartphone photography. Welcome, Olivia. While you're listening, feel free to give us your opinions on Twitter at BHPhotoVideo with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast. Let's define an iconic image. Are they defined by their impact? Are they restricted to a time and a culture? Do they require a passage of time to become iconic? Is it immediate? Is it after the fact? Hal, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, yeah, that's a very good description of an icon. <laughs> all, of the, all of the above is, is the real answer there. Uh, I, I can only give you my definition, and I'm sure that uh, others have their own definition of an icon. But to me, an icon is a picture that while capturing an individual moment, somehow summarizes what has gone before. And if we're lucky, it gives us a peek, if we're lucky and if we're smart enough, it gives us a peek at what will be coming down the road <clears throat> in the future. So that really puts a limit on what pictures are icons, and I would, my personal opinion also is that that word icon is thrown around a lot these days uh, to the point where it's, it's, almost, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a cliche that's lost its cachet, they say. And uh, along with the, the phrase defining moment, it, there just aren't that many defining moments and there just aren't that many pictures that I would call icons. And I'm sure as we talk about pictures, we'll begin to sort out which, which of those. Do you think any right. of that has to do with the fact that there are maybe too many pictures coming out these days and it's sort of being filtered and watered down? It's well, hard to the, spot them. The answer to that is yes, in, in capital letters, and that's a whole paragraph in itself. If, if you want me to go into it, I will. It's actually part three of our discussion. I was so. going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from what you said I'm earlier, it sounds like it's coming down. So let's save it for the for okay. that for that time. I just add that, like um, an iconic image, is also something that moves us. That. Uh, uh, provoke a sort of reaction in the audience and the people who see this uh, this photo. And it can be like a picture that enrage us or um, get, or get us to rethink uh, the way we look at the world and we look at the events that are happening around us. Uh, is it only news photography we're talking about or, or can no, we consider like, it's, no, it's, it's been, open? Yeah, there's been iconic images that are more in the art world. Um, it's, it's really, I'd say, it's something that uh, redefines the way we look at the world, in my opinion. Do you think it needs to, to do more, though? I mean, than, than just that kind of that visceral impact that we feel and the emotional impact that we feel when we see a photo? Because I feel that way about a lot of photos. And, and even going through, you know, Hal's book, Moments, the other day, yesterday, I was touched page after page. I'd, yeah, I'd say that it's the images that moves an entire population, I'd say. Like that... Uh, a, a community, in a way, that moves us collectively. Do you think we can say universally, or is that too much? Or in, there, there's the going to be like there's going to be uh, um, countries that will have uh, different iconic images, you know. Um, so you know, like if we if we come up with a list of the iconic images uh, uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, 
uh, it'll probably end up with a different list than in France or in the UK or China or you know, South America. Yeah. What Olivier says is true. So an icon can mean a lot to one person, and to that person it will be an icon. But I see nothing wrong with that, and I think it's true. One of my favorite pictures I would describe to you, and you would have no meaning to it because it's a, it just has never been shown a lot. But I think the icon has to move people to some kind of action. Mm-hmm. It, it has to have a, a lot of power and, uh, and stimuli to uh, encourage people to do something. But there is also uh, what uh, all of you says is can be very personal, and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I think those are narrower definitions, but I guess that's what we'll struggle through here. Yeah, as we that's talk. what we're here for. Yeah, <laughs> so, something I noticed just this morning on one of, I, I think it was on F-Stoppers, that uh, there's a photographer named An- uh, Anthony Kurtz who based a photograph, an, an, a, an ecology-minded photograph, on Joe Rosenthal's photograph of the raising of the flag, and it it shows several workers planting a tree on top of a landfill. And it's, it mimics it perfectly, but you look, at the, you look at the photograph, you know exactly what it's referring to, but you immediately recognize it's a whole different set of parameters and a different meaning. Well, I think, in my mind, again, that the great icons are caricaturized incredibly. I have a collection of 68 pictures that characterize Joe's, uh, Joe Rosenthal's Iwo Jima picture, and the Naval Institute has another 72 versions of <laughs> so, so the really, and, and that's true of a lot of icons, um, mm-hmm. a lot of the icons that I see as icons. It's like yeah. Mona Lisa, same thing? Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. So you, you can see after September 11, when they raised a flag on the, uh, the rubble of uh, World Trade Center, that was also oh, yeah. like taking, um, inspired by that photograph. They are the great icons are often imitated, yeah. but they never reach the the exactly. the, the, the altitude just, of of, of uh, well, the first original. Know, yeah. It might be fair to say that these recreations are are what bring iconic status to yeah. these images. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're we're so there's so much a part of us that they're so easily recognized, so meaningful in their own way. It's just yeah. another echo of that image. Mm-hmm. Do the photos have to be good to be iconic? They find good. Ah, <laughs> okay, okay. That's a very, that, that that right there is a, a a good question. Let me follow it up here. Um, photography used to be the domain of seasoned professionals, uh, photographers who earn their stripes, who earn the right to be called photographers. Uh, today, anybody with a phone can theoretically capture a Pulitzer Prize-winning picture. Does that cheapen the playing field? Does it lower the bar in any fashion? Like, just look at. Uh Abu Ghraib, for example. Yeah. Uh, the iconic image of the uh, hooded man was taken with um, a point-and-shoot camera by a soldier, um, and it became an icon in a way. Uh, it became – it defined uh, the war in Iraq. It's one of the photos that defined that war. Um, and it wasn't taken by a professional, and it wasn't taken as a as a historical record. It was taken as, you know – Soldiers having fun torturing uh, prisoners, and we don't look at the see what camera has been used or uh, if the person had proper training in photography to define what an icon is. That's that's true. <clears throat> I th- I, th- I think, uh, for example, the 1951 Pulitzer was made by a woman named Virginia Shaw who used a box brownie to shoot a picture of a truck dangling off of a. Bridge. Hmm. And it, it was not an icon, but it was a, what today we'd call a citizen photograph. Mm-hmm. I, I think, though, that if you look at, if we were to gather here 100 pictures that we all agreed were icons, I dare say the vast majority would have been made by professionals. Yeah, definitely. We can talk about citizen photography. I think you have that on your agenda there. Oh, it is um, there. It yeah, is yeah, there. Um, no, but just to follow up on that, this idea that a good photo, yes, it's very hard to define, but if we're talking composition, mm-hmm. lighting, does an iconic image, even a, a photo by a pro, does it does it have to be a good photo or is it just more about the moment, the time, and the, the relevancy over time? Well, it's all of the above. It, you know, that's mm-hmm. the wonderful thing about photography. If yeah. A dramatic moment can, can overpower composition or bad composition. A good composition can overpower a not-so-dramatic moment. Mm-hmm. That's one of the charms and one of the challenges of 
Okay. And when you um, look at think about picture quality, also uh, you th- people think um, iconic pictures by Ansel Adams. They have a very different aesthetic and technical quality than a lot of war photographs, which are out of focus, blurry, and grainy. Yeah, look at Robert Capa's uh, sure. D-Day photograph. Like, exactly, they're bad. Uh, photograph when you look at the, the quality, like say it, they're blurry, uh, they're taken like you know like he's under fire, you know, and he doesn't have time to just you know get Close, the perfect. Yeah. They don't make the checklist in any exactly. way. Contrast, yeah. grain, exactly. nothing. Um, um, it's true, and it just yeah, it just worked because it was um, the moment was important. You know. It was also alone, <laughs> exactly, uh, not exclusive, but alone, yeah. and uh, that counts a lot yeah. because that means the picture will get distributed and be seen and mm-hmm. it's very repeated presence, which we should get into in the internet conversations, gives a picture credibility that it may or may not deserve. Yeah. Like Kappa's yeah. picture did deserve it, but a lot of it's lousy only, pictures. Yeah. It's the only record of that event. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. As it turned out, that's right. Yeah. Um, Hal, you've described Vietnam as being the last full access war for photographers, where photographers were actually there on the front lines recording things firsthand. And then that whole access disappeared and it's been replaced by, like we just said, civilians and soldiers in their downtime with phones. Well, there's more to it than that. Yeah. Uh, please. Ac- access has been denied. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, that the thing that I've often said uh, that um, – the Vietnam was photographed like no war before, and I believe it's highly unlikely that any war in the future will be photographed the way Vietnam was photographed because the photographers had instant access to the battlefield. There was no censorship. In fact, uh, the U.S. government went out of its way to get photographers and writers to the scene of action while it was still going on, and that's why those pictures were so dramatic. Mm-hmm. That's like, mm-hmm. like Kappa's picture, he was there at the invasion. That's why that picture is dramatic. Right. Mm-hmm. Not because of the, the quality, certainly, but yeah. because he was there. Mm-hmm. And um, the Vietnam thing is a whole other subject for discussion because it, there are many icons that came out of Vietnam. And uh, I don't know if we want to start that now. Feel free. Feel free. Yeah, right. go for it. I'll give Olivia a chance to no, jump in. <laughs> don't I'll, worry. I'll go ahead. Well, there were three great icons, right, From the, at least I think from the war. One was the burning monk picture made by a, a writer, not a photographer. Hmm. Interesting. And that, that picture was so dramatic that it lifted the war from the back alley stage of a sometimes cover to the front page, and it stayed there for 10 years. So that picture was important because the attention, uh, icons also bring attention to something. We talked about that earlier. It, it brought attention to the story. Then along came Eddie Adams with his picture of the Saigon execution, the man, sh- uh, the uh, colonel shooting the Viet Cong. Everybody, well, it helped in the war. Well, it didn't help in the war. The war lasted longer after the picture was made <laughs> than it existed before the picture was made. But it made people get off the fence who had opinions about the war or, or had no opinion, and they jumped one way or the other. So in that sense, it, it was a force. Nick Goetz's picture, again, said to have ended the war, but the war lasted three years after this that picture. This is the photograph of the, the children of the running na- down the yes, road the child, after the naked na- girl. Yes, right. That picture became a symbol of the horror of war and, re- and exists today, even more than Eddie's. It exists today as, as a photographic icon, a, iconic example of the horror of war and how the innocents are caught in the crossfire. Absolutely. So there's all, all those are different definitions of exactly. what an icon is, yeah. as we were said earlier. The Saigon assassination, which I know you can go into into detail, while it, it brought people off the fence and, and engaged and started this debate in such a way, was it an accurate image? Eddie was, uh, Eddie was the ideal wire service photographer because Eddie had no political agenda. Right. That's what I can and, understand And uh, he made a picture that happened in front of him, and he frankly didn't think that much of the picture <laughs> mm-hmm. and talked negatively about the picture most of his life. That's he didn't feel it was that good. He felt... He didn't he, feel it was good in what he, sense? He, he, he didn't feel the picture told a whole story of why that took place, that execution mm-hmm. took place. He didn't... The picture didn't tell about how the aid of Luan's aide and his wife and his children were assassinated by the Viet Cong. It didn't tell about what had gone on that day before that guy, the Viet Cong was captured and, and so on and so forth. And he said it ruined Luan's life. And Eddie felt Luan and a lot of people also felt Luan was a nationalist hero. That's an interesting story, but I would imagine that 
most photographs, be they iconic or otherwise, that affect people's emotions or feelings, um, it's based on their perception of it anyway. And quite often, we're totally ignorant of what the true backstory is behind a lot of these sort oh, of absolutely. things. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely. That's very true. Can I ask? Were, were you specifically involved in that photo? Right. And in, in- I was. Uh, I was in Asia from uh, 1959 until 1964, and the war was really just beginning to pick up in the late 63 and into 64. So when I came back to New York, I kind of became <laughs> the, Sa- the Vietnam guy in New York, mm-hmm. and I, I worked closely with the Saigon staff mm-hmm. and with Eddie. At that time, Eddie was in the domestic service and, and worked closely with Eddie on other projects. By chance, did you see a contact sheet? Was there a oh, series no. of photos leading no, it was up? all done in Vietnam. Okay, so you, know, you weren't specific. What happened? Well, if, if you really want to get into that. I have a fast question. Just curious about one thing. Today we have everything is, is instantaneous. Mm-hmm. That photograph's taken in Vietnam, on average, how long did it take them between the time the picture was taken out, God knows where, oh. and the time it hit the, pay, uh, the newspapers, oh, I would, the news well, bars? No, in that case it didn't take long. I would say four or five hours. Because there were radio photo circuits from Vietnam to New York, to uh, Tokyo or Manila or Frankfurt, <laughs> and those were automatically relayed into the U.S. network. So, so it wasn't a bad it wasn't a bad delay then. No, not okay. not in that case. There, there were some delays on some other Vietnam pictures. The radio photocopy out of Vietnam was really bad quality, and so we tried to rely more on prints that were. Saigon would enter the stuff and then ship it to New York, and we would then re-edit it and put this, put a lot of original material on the mm-hmm. network. But the hot pictures, like the Saigon, like Nick Utz, like a lot of others, went out immediately by radio. Gotcha. Can I jump backwards a bit to the, the idea of good photos and art photos? Because uh, to me, the idea of, of photos, Ansel Adams, even Dorothea Lang, maybe that's different. Uh, I don't think of those as iconic. My iconic images always go to news images, things that are specifically related to an event or in some cases even to a certain celebrity or a time, which is also in a, a time and place. I think, uh, for example, one of my favorite photos is the Robert Frank's photo of the trolley car in, in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great photo, and it could be iconic. It could define America in one shot. But do people think of that as an iconic photo? And, and can art photos be iconic photos? Are they? It depends to a great deal on the atmosphere that the photo drops into and yeah. people begin to see it. There's, yeah. that, there's a lot of pressure there that either downplays or uplifts the photo. Mm-hmm. And that was, that's true of a lot of the Vietnam stuff. And, and uh, the same with some of the stuff from Katrina. And, although I don't know that any picture there I would call iconic. And, yeah. it's, but then it's a personal, yeah. personal <laughs> definition. Well, yeah, I think this is kind of why we're here to some degree to yeah. get, we all personally feel photos. There's no doubt about that. But when do they go beyond that? I mean, when can we say something is... Universal is a big word. I don't want to use it, but you know, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah. that is bigger than just something that I feel or you feel or this group feels, but let, a lot of people. Let me say one other thing on Vietnam, and, and uh, I, I don't want to dominate this conversation, but it, it wasn't an individual picture that influenced greatly what went on. There was, there was, this, there was this incredibly up, upscale level of photography that came out day after day after day after day over a period of five, five or six years. That's where the influence of photography on their perception of the war in the United States and other places of the world really came from. And there were these spikes of Nick Ott and Eddie Adams and Mel Brown and a, and a few others that were great pictures. But it was that steady flow, that drip, 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 drip. Every day there was something coming down the line. And it was and the same with the magazines. Every life yeah. ran series after series after series. From Larry Burroughs was one of the great life photographers. He did a lot of wonderful pictures. It, mm-hmm. it, it was that drilling, that constant, and and you could escape level, it, yeah, a high level all the way. I love. I mean, this is maybe a conversation for another podcast, but I'd love to get into the idea of why that's changed. Why the relationship between uh, the military, the press? Uh, that's an easy question. It, it's, <laughs> the military took a beating. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they, they resolved that yeah. they weren't going to take another beat. Basically, yeah. I mean, I remember during the first Gulf War when you could feel that happening. You could feel that kind of closure, and and we're not going to go down that path again. And uh, and here we are with embedded photographers, but images still get out. I mean, we we see these images, but not in the volume of Vietnam, not in that daily, 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 daily. Plus, the, the present stuff in the Middle East is a little more remote from the American mind than Vietnam mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. When you look at a Vietnam picture, that's my son. That's the kid next door whose face I'm looking at, as opposed to 
what we see in the Middle East, Middle East which are, are mm -hmm, different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And Photography is tricky. Yeah, it sure <laughs> is. And in, with Lightbox, are you dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of news coming in and decisions that have to be made? Or do you get a chance to kind of have a broader overlook? So the so nice thing about Lightbox is that we sit kind of like in the middle between the print and uh, online. So we have the opportunity of take a breather and and look at what's coming in. But I'd say going back to the iconic images, often you need months or years uh, to realize which photograph is an iconic image. Um, it doesn't, sometimes you'll see an image and you're like, that's going to be an important image. That's going to be a defining image. But is it going to be iconic? It takes a lot of time for it to happen. And if you look back over the past 10 years, um, it's very difficult to, to name these iconic images. You look back like, 50 years ago, the Vietnam War or um, America in the 50s, 60s, you can find these iconic images because we had the hindsight. We've, uh, um, we had time to digest all of the photos there. Speaking the of hindsight, do you ever go backwards in, in Lightbox or do you only yeah. deal with contemporary? You do go back. We, we do go back. We, uh, we look at the, the stories of uh, the iconic images of the past uh, and, you know, like, Time is like life is part of the, the time brand, and so we have these archives that are sitting there and like full of gems, you know, like and, and, and images that need to be seen again. Well, I think what you're saying gets to this idea, and, and even with the Eddie Adams image, uh, the photos have a life of their own. I mean, once they're taken and once they're out there, we almost have no say as the photographer or the editor, it becomes a decision of the people to some degree. I mean... Distribution counts, too. Uh, thank you. That was you know, the, the You know, the famous picture, The Kiss by Eisenstein, mm -hmm. that was made by another photographer, a Navy photographer named Jorgensen. Admittedly, not as good, but not that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, similar, but not as good. But Eisenstein's picture was distributed, and people saw it. They said, oh, wow, mm -hmm. and that became the picture. And the other one is... In the, NAS, in the NARA files, right. <laughs> turns up every once in a while. <laughs> well, that's a very good point. I think that was a question that we had on our list of, you know, how does the companies that own the images and the distribution method affect their... Well, especially if you look today at the, the, the way uh, the media works with uh, social media. Like, I, look, looking back at uh, last year in September, uh, there's a picture of Alan Curdy. And I am not going to say that it's... Um, That's the, the baby. Um, yeah, it's a baby. Uh, up on the to, beach, yeah, right? exactly. It's a Syrian uh, baby washed up on the Turkey uh, beach. I'm not going to say that it's an iconic image because it's too soon, but it's an important photo. Um, and it wasn't published first. It, it didn't reach that status uh, thanks to the media. It, uh, it got there because of social media. It's because... Uh, someone shared it on Twitter, and then someone else retweeted it, and then it just went completely viral like that. And it pushed the, uh, the newsroom to actually take that photo a lot more seriously uh, because the audience wanted it. Um, but two weeks before, there were photos like that, the same photos, uh, on the wires, you know. And it just, the public wasn't moved by these photos. It's just this one kid actually move people, push people to do something, and then it reached uh, mm -hmm. the status that he You had. know, that's an interesting point you make. There were pictures before that from different sources, that, and many of them were more dramatic. Exactly. But you know what? I, I This is a personal. What made the difference was there was a kid with a red sweater, yes. like all the kids in the neighborhood. Exactly. And it's this instant it's identification. Exactly. Completely. Picture, and that's what lifted it out. I, yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's a good point, yeah. That's a very it good it point. was, it could be like, it basically became, it could be your kid. It Absolutely. could be your brother, your sister. It could be anyone that you know. I personally think that it, if any image will be iconic, that's it. it, it and it's interesting to hear what you say, uh, the way it, it took a life of its own and, and, and came through social media. I mean, there are little elements, and as you mentioned, the, the, the clothes, uh, even the, the soldier or the, the official there, just, up, he's yeah. kind of just on a checklist it's a check he's just yeah. kind of doing his work it's almost like it's not happening and, mm -hmm. and there's something about the idea of 
pl- like the beach is a place for a kid to play. That's yeah. and, and, and he's there at the shore, and especially it's, there. Like it's it's a very popular tourist destination. Oh yeah, it's it's where you like if you're going to Turkey uh, uh, for the summer, that's where you go, mm-hmm. and then suddenly this beach is turned into a graveyard. Yeah, you you mentioned that it was the public that brought that yeah. picture even more into the forefront mm-hmm. than it originally was. That it made it, it brought me back to a, a picture I mentioned in the beginning of Falling Man, uh, which was taken uh, at, at 9-11. And I believe that was actually by an AP photographer. Rich, from Richard Drew. Richard Drew, correct. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, that picture appeared in one of the inner pages of the New York Times the next day. I think it was from the first edition after the attack. And for, and for those who don't know about it, Falling Man was an incredible photograph of, of a person who had to make a choice or was forced out of the building from an upper floor and they're falling more or less straight head down with the uh, uh, vertical stripes of the tower behind him. One foot is bent as if he's marching or walking upstairs and he's frozen there and and it, the picture itself froze me when I saw it. He's talking about it freezes. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, it, now one interesting thing is that the outcry of that, for that photograph from readers, they retracted it and did not, that picture did not appear in the Times for another seven years, I think. And that picture, as peaceful as it was, was considered more horrifying than the pictures of the planes blasting through the buildings in flames. Mm -hmm. And it was pulled off. You can identify with that man. You can see yourself on that ledge and the fires on one side of you and 82 floors is on the other side of you. And that, I can't and that even comprehend your mind. it. Yeah. Yeah. But despite the fact the impact of that picture was phenomenal. Oh, it was. Okay. They, the documentary they, was done. They backed and, down yeah. from, from publishing it. Would that still hold today? Yes, because editors are very, very sensitive about pictures like that. And that includes uh, the, the boy on the beach that mm-hmm. uh, Olivier referred to. Um, the immediate reaction is not to publish it because of the horror that the picture projects. And editors will get a lot of letters, and mm-hmm. I could tell you 50 stories of uh, back-and-forth arguments between editors and their, and their readers over why they did or didn't yeah. publish a certain picture. But as, as, we, as was pointed out here, the picture caught on, and, and you almost had to publish it. it yeah. There was just no option. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there it was on it. Now it's distributed widely and it becomes the icon mm-hmm. concept starts to take shape. Interesting. Interesting. What about photographs that we've long looked at as being iconic because they, they, they are embedded in our consciousness and then we find out that they were fake to some extent. Uh, and there are a few photographs that, that have been out there for decades that fall into that category. Is it cheap in them? Um, it, it sort of borderlines well, on commercial photography, even though it's supposed to be editorial. Well, I, I, one photo that comes to mind, and there's always been so much debate about it, is the falling soldier. Yeah. Uh, and it's a if, terrific photograph. It is a terrific, like, it's, it's, and it's an amazing. And it's the best one from the contact sheet that shows all the variations. Exactly. And <laughs> I'd say that the, um, in this particular case, whether it was fake or not, it conveyed uh, the idea of what was happening at that time. It actually got people to think about the Spanish War in a in a very different way. Um, and so, I'd almost say that it didn't really matter whether it was fake or not. Does that also hold true for photographers who were seen rearranging things at the at Ground Zero the days? following the attack for more drama. The first war photo that was uh, taken, and I'm forgetting the name of the photographer, of this uh, the valley of uh, death. Um, there's two versions of that photo. One is uh, it's a, you have the slope and then the plane. It's, it's a valley like uh, where a battle just happened. And there's one version where there's no cannonball on the and then there's another version where there's cannonballs. And so you know that something happened, that the photographers there moved the cannonballs. Um, and I know the New York Times did a very long uh, investigation on this. That's fascinating. And for the photographer, with the cannonballs, he was able to actually convey 
uh, the terrible events that had happened there. Actually, Earl, Earl Morris, I hope I got the yes, name right, yes. wrote a book about that. Exactly. On that yeah. picture. And I read the book and I said, boy, the guy put a lot of effort into not much. <laughs> 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 but anyway, he examined the whole thing and came out that he didn't really know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't know. Exactly. You know, the the great, in my judgment, the greatest icon of all, the Iwo Jima picture, suffered an incredible criticism over that very issue. That, that there, are, there, and there was a first flag that went up. And that the picture that Joe made was a posed picture of a, a of a photographer conniving with the Marine Corps to make this incredible photograph. Not true. The picture was indeed unposed and spontaneous. But to this day, to mm -hmm. this day, people say, yeah, that was posed, wasn't it? And, of course, I go crazy and say, <laughs> no, it wasn't posed. What about image manipulation, which is easier to do now than, than it's ever been? And... and it's getting incredibly hard to detect in some instances. Rephrase the question to bring it back where we started. Can you make an icon by manipulating the picture? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let somebody else answer that question. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't you. go for it. I don't know that's ever happened. But, <laughs> but photographers have altered pictures, and a lot of them have been fired over it. There's, mm -hmm. But some get through, and there are steps that have been taken to watch for that kind of thing. And... And successful, but the problem with manipulation, there are two. The, the heavy manipulation that becomes satire. Mm -hmm. You know, people believe that the satire is true. Uh, there, there was, to use a classic example, there was a picture of a flipped picture of um, Obama and Michelle saluting with the wrong hand. And, uh, you know, you look at it and I look at it, we say, it was flipped. But a lot of people believe he was saluting with the wrong hand. And as it moves along the network... People see it, oh, yeah, who don't like Obama say, yeah, you see that? You mm -hmm. see that? And the next guy, pretty soon it has its own credibility. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger of the Internet. Anybody can put those kind of pictures out there. So that, yeah. that's a problem. And, and the case that I think both of us would have to deal with is the, is the kind of minute manipulation. It, where, where do you draw the line on manipulation? You, you just say no. Yeah. <laughs> no manipulation of any kind. If, now, you all know what happened with the World Press photo when they had to, yeah. had to take back a bunch of prizes. Yeah. And, and the answer the is no manipulation. Yeah. I don't know. When, when you work with news, um, there cannot be any manipulation, you know. And so, like, art photographers have a tendency to be more, they have more freedom in what they can do. But you're not going to hire an art photographer in a news context and expect uh, that art photographer to... Um, start um, faking things. You know, it's like if it's a news context, no manipulation. Um, you, you stole my thunder with the art business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, one thing that bugs me personally is when they start to talk about art and journalism in the same paragraph, I get very nervous. <laughs> Picasso no, notably said that art is a lie that can lead you to the truth. And artists have that freedom. Their message, their way of saying the message, and God bless them, and sometimes they reach the truth. Journalists don't have that luxury. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, how digital photography and Internet dissemination has changed the status and influence of iconic photography. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us with your questions or comments, email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. Let's talk about digital photography and internet dissemination uh, and, and how, how has it affected iconic pictures? So one thing now is that we're overwhelmed with photographs, I'd say. Uh, there is so much out there, so much being produced and so much being thrown at us. And whether that's commercial photography that we see on ads everywhere, but also news photography. Um, I know that the photo editors at Time uh, every day are probably looking at ten to 20,000 photos coming in the wires. How many layers of filters do you have? Because as you're talking, I'm thinking about the fact that I know people who have been picture editors and it used to be somewhat manageable, but now you are getting more images than you can possibly register in your head. Are there different layers of filtration before it gets, say, to you or whoever you work with? Or are you opening up every envelope? So to speak. So see, uh, see, online photo editors will be seeing everything, uh, and they'll make a, a selection depending on what they're trying to find. You know, um, see, print editors have the the opportunity of 
uh, creating their own images in a sense that like in assigning photographers to the events. Uh, I'd say that's the, the, the different filters we have in place. But you're still seeing every single day thousands of images. And not just from the wire, but like walking around town, you're seeing thousands of images. With your phone, you're seeing thousands of images. Uh, whether it's on Instagram or you're following the New York Times or it's everywhere. Um, and I think that affects the, um, the, the creation of these iconic images. Because... Because since you're seeing so many images, you don't have time to reflect as much on each one of them. And actually, I'd say, the, get to understand the power of that image. That would be the biggest difference, I'd say. Do you get numb by it all? Don't what you thought. Well, being the oldest guy in the room with all you young fellas, let me paint two. <laughs> let me paint two pictures for you. By the way, thank you very much for taking You're over welcome. my role. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-digital, AP transmitted 120 pictures a day to newspapers. <laughs> if we had color, that took up three or four of those 120 pictures a day. So not much color went out, and I am known for having to tell people this transmission is coming and we're not going to send you more pictures. We're going to send you better pictures, faster and better quality. We now send each paper close to 900 pictures a day and we transmit 2,000 pictures because they don't all go everywhere. And so does Reuters and so does Getty. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting here looking at 6,000 pictures today. Now, this is my feeling of what happens. When you're looking at 120 pictures, you look at every picture and you say one time, oh, look at that. Isn't that odd? There's Marilyn Monroe standing on with her skirt blowing. Oh, my, maybe we'll put that in the paper because it's odd. Not because it's important, mm -hmm. but because it's odd. When you're looking through 6,000 pictures, you necessarily have to say, what's the lead story? Obama press conference. What do you got in the Obama press conference? I need a two column. I need a three column. Now, I'm exaggerating. It's not, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a looking for pictures, but a lot of the serendipity is lost in the editing of pictures, I think, today because of the volume. But that's not going to change, I'll also tell you that. You think it's going to change? Not at all. No, no. It's going to get worse and worse. It's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> However, the go, going back to the image uh, of the boy on the beach, despite the volume, we still see that there's one image that will come through. It may not be through the editor's desk, but uh, they're still making their way out, no? Well, what what is happening is that the agencies, at least, are now beginning to say, I don't know what they call it because I'm a little remote from it, to today's best bets. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll list 50 or 60 pictures that the agency thinks. Well, now the agency's kind of editing it, aren't they? That They become the gatekeeper. Now at a place like Time or, or one of the big magazines, they have people that I think even the television stations have people that look for the unusual or look for picture series or things that they can put together. But it, it's hard. It's just a and lot of, of work. And of this increased volume, would you say that there's more photographers taking equally as good photos or there's just less good photos in that group? You want to comment? Or? I'd, I'd say that um, um, you still have the amazing photographers sending amazing photos. Uh, but you also have the, the noise. Like, I think there's no other word for it. Like, it's the noise of every single event is now documented. Uh, whether it be, like, the Oscars where you get, like, thousands of photos from the Oscars. But to every single little meeting between two head of state to uh, an event downtown, um, for this car company or this other, um, these photos will be produced. And they're not the kind of photos that are going to produce, uh, are going to come, it's not the kind of photo that you're going to find the icon mm -hmm. from there. Like it's, 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 but they it's, exist. They have to be there right. because there's a, a sort of purpose for, uh, the news organization or the uh, marketing organization. It, it's also true uh, that that photographers today are better photographers, I mean, photo makers, than they were historically. And uh, they're better educated, they have better equipment that's more flexible, and for a lot of reasons, 
there are better better pictures being made. So in the in the fifties and sixties even the unusual picture stands out because there aren't that many pictures. Now you've got a lot of other pictures that are good. Mm-hmm. So, the, so, the, so the icon picture has to be that much better because all the others along here are as good as some of the icons over here. So the nature, the, the, the flow of pictures is different. And it's just you, different. You, you're, you're saying that the quality of the pictures is better, generally speaking. I, I'm assuming you mean technically because it used to be that when you used no, the I camera. No, content too. You believe, Te- technically you, you believe that? I think so. You, you, you tell yeah. me if, I, if you agree well, with that. Well, look at the Alan Correa uh, photo. It's not a good photo. Um, yeah, like true. the composition is, is not great. Um, the, the colors are not great. Um, and you can, you can tell that the photographer was either rushed or also, you know, taken by the emotion of that scene, you know. Um, but it still made it an important photo. It still got people to react to it and to share it and to create the whole um, movement behind it. Mm-hmm. Well, also getting back to the volume, there the more photos are used. No, isn't it fair to say that? I mean, oh, that, yeah. that, I mean, you you may be used, getting used, used online, in general, not uh, in print, not online, in print, yes, but online. but uh, let's say you get six thousand photos in in a day. Of that 6,000, more will be generally used than would have in the past. Bear this in mind. They are not all seen the way they were seen previously. Before yeah. you do a paper or a magazine, you put out the magazine and there's the picture, there's the paper. It may lay there overnight or the next day or on the sake of a Sunday paper the whole week. A magazine comes in and lays on the coffee table. Today, on lines, picture may be up 10 minutes and maybe up an hour and a half, maybe up longer, but it may not. And a lot of them up there, life is short time on the, on the internet. <laughs> It's there. If you don't catch it on the first hop, it's gone and it's lost. It, even the good ones. Right. Or yeah. you have a series of photos and people yeah. will just look at the first three and the last seven will, will not even get clicked through. I mean, oh, yeah. Of do you guys do, do you do studies on that? Do you guys kind of metric? I'm sure we have people doing this. You know, uh, like I that. try not to. Um, <laughs> you don't want to, to start making decision on what uh, is popular or what works. Um, I, like I try to, to stay with the what I think is worth. One of the, the shots that you had included, I don't know if you specifically, but Lightbox in the shots of 2015 was actually a still from a video image of a police officer shooting a man running away. Mm-hmm. How did that decision come about to include what is not even really a photo? And is that something you see, you think that we will be seeing more of, uh, excerpted video stills taken it's, as photos? Well, in this particular case, um, it was the first video uh, of a police officer killing, uh, shooting someone, and in this case, in the back. You know, like he'd been charged with murder. Um, and that video was put under a microscope where every single newspaper and magazine were taking the frames to show the, the impact of, of that event. Mm-hmm. Um, and it redefined the, the debate around race in the U.S. And we felt it was one of the most important image. Maybe not a photograph, but it's still one of the most important image of the year. Right. Video has always been watched by the users of still pictures for the still picture extract. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty common. One of the early Pulitzers 50, in the 50s was a racial picture of a football player breaking the jaw of another football player on purpose. And that was way back then, that was taken from motion picture footage. And in the early, early, early days before wire photo, AP got a lot of his pictures from newsreels. Because in those days, you know, they shot 35 millimeter, you had like a half frame and pretty good quality. And when, yeah, when you think about it, uh, with the origin of video, it's just 24 frame a second, 24 still images. Well, it's interesting. And as you spoke earlier about the, the shot of the truck dangling off the bridge, citizen journalism, frames being taken from, from, from footage, from, we're not really changing as much as we think we are, no? What's changed is the volume. It's, volume what, is yeah. really... <laughs> what changed is the fact that now we're all able to record this event. We all have a phone in our pocket that can shoot HD video and take 12 megapixel photos. Uh, you look at the uh, the... 
It's a plane landing on the Hudson River. Um, it's the first photos of that came from the passengers himself mm -hmm. because they had the phone and they were able to take these photos. Um, so you're always going to end up where if something is happening around the world, um, maybe the first photos coming out of that event will be taken by an amateur, a, a that, that, normal person. That has, that has been true historically and remains yeah. true. The big difference now is that photographers can transmit immediately from almost anywhere with a computer and a satellite connection. So, True. so the the, uh, the professional uh, still still camera pictures are better. So, so many times, video just gets something that nobody else gets, and that's where you start yeah. looking and hunting. Exactly. Last question that I have has to do with layoffs and budget cuts of all of the major news gathering and news organizations. There's a change going on where they're used to, even though everyone now has a camera and everyone takes pictures and any picture could become quote unquote iconic, the, the, the vehicles for getting them there are being etched away at. It is, it well, is going to change anybody, somehow. Anybody who thinks that you can do a written, a word story, still pictures and video and audio and one person can do that is sadly, sadly mistaken, and it will work to the disadvantage of good journalism. Let's say a photo comes in from a citizen journalist, and then do you look at them differently, quality aside, in terms of what you're going to run? You look at the news value. You look at, uh, is it the best image to explain what's happening uh, right there? And uh, I'll take an example that uh, happened last year with Time is uh, when everything happened in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of professional photographers who were down in Baltimore covering the protest. And then we came across this photo on Instagram from a local, I'd say at that time he was amateur photographer, uh, loved to sh shoot portrait. And he was born in, in, in West Baltimore. He knew that town and he ended up in the middle of a protest shooting this one image of cops rushing towards the uh, protesters. And what really, what was very interesting about that image is that the sort of blurry nature of the photo, the grainy nature of the photo, made the cops look like they were from the 50s. Mm -hmm. And it put a different spin on the story where it linked everything that happened in America's past uh, around race uh, and put it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And it felt like nothing had changed. And that made it the most interesting photo at that time of these, uh, of, of, of this protest, this the news events, event. Right. Um, and so that's what comes into the mind of a photo editor. Is it the best photo to explain what's happening uh, and to, to, to get people to so understand? The, the playing, once it comes to your desk, the playing field is level in terms of who it came from. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. How could, it, how could any competitive journalistic organization not use the best picture or what in their judgment exactly. is the best picture? Mm -hmm. That's and, happened at and AP a lot. And do you feel a conflict to some degree then to this issue of, of professional photographers finding perhaps less and less work or getting paid less? I mean, because you're not favoring that work over but the other. You look at uh, going back to that photo of Baltimore. Um, one... Um, the guy who shot it was a photographer. Right. Or he may become a great photographer. And now, like, right. now it also helped his career. Right. Um, but I'd say that it shouldn't be the kind of element that comes into the decision-making decision process mm -hmm. of showing what happened. Mm -hmm. And if the best photo comes from an amateur, so be it. So be it. You remember uh, the Oklahoma City bomb bombing affair, and the, the key picture was a fireman carrying a child. Yes, mm -hmm. that's made by an amateur. Mm -hmm. Now, to find that amateur, <laughs> this guy was this what we used to call an advanced amateur. He had a full camera. He was really a mortgage mortgage clerk in the mm -hmm. bank, mm -hmm. and he heard this explosion, and he he wanted well, might make some pictures there. He took his camera, out, went out, and he made this picture. And somebody else made a similar picture. There were opposite. There were similar pictures on the Time and Newsweek. Both used different pictures of the same incident. And both were made by pictures who we would call amateurs, but who are really professional level 
Like your the same story yeah. you're telling about yeah. the the uh, yeah, the, Baltimore like thing. the camera makers uh, call that uh, semi-professionals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> enthusiasts. So actually, actually, enthusiasts. Actually, you know, <laughs> it, 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 you can challenge this. I don't think that many that that many citizen photos get used. I I think no. it's a very small because most of them are are it's unusable. Very, very and these TV guys. You know, send in your pictures and we'll put it up. And you get a chair with snow on it, and you know, <laughs> yeah, and right, right, the railing right. of the right. deck. It's it's great for engagement, you know. But That's what like, they say. We, yeah. we get the people to participate, and exactly. I say, why do you want those people to participate? They want the clicks. <laughs> <laughs> when, now, when people hear that, then I'm going to hear about. No. <laughs> but if, you're, if you're doing a, the Baltimore story, say for example, are you or someone on your staff going to be checking Instagram feeds every day with hashtag Baltimore? Is that common practice now? When something breaks, when something is very important, um, we'll use, you know, we have a software that we use that like allows us to look at Instagram according to location uh, and hashtags, but it will not be our first uh, point of call. Uh, right away, we'll go on the wire. Um, and it's only when we realize there's nothing on the wire or the photographers are not there, then we look at another source of photography. But if we just added Instagram to our mix, we'd be looking at hundreds of thousands of images every yeah. single day and we'll just... Pretty coffee shortages. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Right. We've kind of gone away from the idea of iconic images to some degree, but because we have such an opportunity here, I, I want to ask kind of a serious question, more somber. I don't mean it glibly or, or naively, but how do you handle the, uh, you know, the, the carnage? the the sadness that you see regularly just looking through your book yesterday at pulitzer's over the years i was brought to tears and it has to have an effect and is it can you i think photographers feel that more than editors do i could be wrong but i think that's the case and there has been a lot written in the last 10 years about ptsd as far as photographers are concerned and I know. Uh, I know. Dick Drew was really upset when he bought that picture he made of the falling man, and and others have. Uh, they, there are, there have been cases where photographers just said enough and they mm -hmm. walk away from it. It's a really good part of the book. The the after effect on some of the photographers yeah. of, of those images that they took. Yeah, right. and and uh, also it's become more dangerous for photographers now. Now photographers up up until almost all the way through Vietnam, photographers took risks. But they took risks they understood. Now they have become the subject of assassination, and a lot of it. Not, I mean, reporters too, not just. But photographers are identifiable because right. they're loaded with right. this equipment, and uh, so there've been a lot of a lot of photographers murdered. But in terms of the this this the the kind of the daily feed of, of images, of heartbreak and and bloodshed, do you? Is there enough distance? You're not the photographer. On the editor's part, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the editor's part. I right? have not noted that, but maybe maybe you have. I've, I've, I've known uh, colleagues that have to deal with that sort of uh, uh, PTSD. I'd say that the, the one thing that we have compared to the, the photographers is that we can just turn off the, com the computer mm -hmm. mm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. The photographer often has to be in this place, live right. with their photos, right. live right. with the things. And go out so. tomorrow and do the same right. thing. Exactly. Yeah. You, you mentioned right. that Richard Drew is, is tr haunted or troubled by the photo yeah. of the falling man. Is it because yeah. he took the picture or is it because, because of, of the effects of, of the because picture? Because of the effect of the picture, of the picture itself. Like I said, you just look at that picture and you think of the decision the guy had to make up on that, wherever he was, on the 82nd floor. That's That's... I feel that. I can't imagine how the photographer feels that made the picture of the guy mm -hmm. after he made the decision. I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. No argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no so a couple of questions about iconic images, and we can wrap up from there. But uh, we were talking earlier about the Kappa image in World War II, uh, D-Day. And speaking as a European, are there images that you may recognize that Americans feel as iconic that you never even thought twice about or, or vice versa? Um I'll take the, uh, the uh, Robert Frank uh, photo of the trolley in New Orleans. Um, you show that photo to the majority of French people, they, it will not be an iconic image. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
And I can understand why, because um, it really, that photo really spoke to the American public in terms of the situation, um, uh, so race, racial um, uh, separation that were deeply rooted in society at that time. For a French person, you look at that image and it's just a trolley. A trolley. Right. Right. Let's say, for example, to put a definition on iconic, it, it does has to do with culture. There's no way to separate. You know, you had in France the events, the the, the murders and the attack recently. Are any of those photos, as far as you know, becoming ingrained that I'd say, iconic more so than they might be here? So I'd say one, it's too soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's a couple of photos that uh, that I've seen um, that really moved me. Uh, there's one by uh, Jean Delay, um, an AP photographer, um, of this body uh, under a sheet and lying on on that street and it's alone and it's like there's no one around it there's no cops everything Mm -hmm. and it's alone there and that photo really moved me that photo did move people and and i cannot explain it it moved me but i don't know why Hmm. that's exactly yeah there's something that's a very interesting picture i don't know why i was moved by that picture because it's the simplest kind of a picture you can imagine very simple and And it would take a i know delay very well and it would it would take somebody like him to even think of making that picture. I know. Interesting. It's so stark. Yeah. It's interesting. Completely. Yeah. But is it going to be an iconic image? Mm. I don't know. Right. Time. Is that, it's I mean, the time. Uh, we're, we're working helps. toward a definition here. Culture, time. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You need a list of 15 things that contribute to me. Yeah. Exactly. Icons. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah. also true that I think icons are perceived differently in Europe than they are in the United yeah. States. Mm-hmm. Are there any images that stand out in that you would say is an iconic European image that we may not be familiar with, or either of you? That's a good <laughs> question. What picture transcends? Mm. As great as Joe Rosenthal's picture is, it means a lot more to Americans than it does to Europeans. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mussolini hanging by his feet after World War II. Mm-hmm. Remember, that's a terrible picture, but it said something about. The picture that uh, Kaldi did of the flag, the Russian flag in Berlin, but that's such a f- put the, <laughs> such a f- I hate to say phony, but it's a, cre- it's a created picture. But still, it, it yeah. I'm, I think certainly in Russia, it's no. and Stalin himself got involved in it yeah. to a ridiculous. That's a long story, but it's, mm-hmm. that's an interesting picture mm-hmm. that fits into that category. Mm-hmm. It's a good question you pose. <laughs> We're going to end this with a question we can't answer. <laughs> and maybe that is the answer. Well, how about we just end with one that, that you, we can throw out and answer. Uh, what is, a to you or both of you, two or three images that undoubtedly are iconic photos? And then also, if you don't mind, maybe from this year. I mean, we've talked about this year enough, I guess. But Historically and, or all, yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, forever. You go first if you like. Um, I'll try to take in different genres uh, and it might not be my favorites but like for example you look at The Afghan Girl by Steve McCurry uh, on the National Geographic cover this is an iconic image Um, it's not really really a news photo but it's a photo that everyone will recognize and everybody stops when they see it exactly she makes you pause yeah Um, one that uh, moved me also would be uh, Chris Andros' um, photo of this Iraqi little girl who um, entire family just got uh, killed by U.S. soldiers at a checkpoint, and she's covered in their blood. Um, that for me was an iconic image of the Iraq War. Um, and another one, it's a defining moment by uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, that guy just jumping over that uh, puddle of water at the right time. So not necessarily news images. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would vote for the Iwo picture because it is impossible to recreate the impact of that picture on the on American culture at that time. It, it, I written a book on it, and I don't think I covered it all. <laughs> it's just. The impact was staggering. Mm-hmm. 
and 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 that you just can't take that away from it and plus it's put together as a picture should be mm-hmm. i i always felt that the uh, hindenburg pictures any any one of them because it marked the end of lighter than air flight and also it was an attack there were several pictures there was that picture there was uh, Jesse Owens and caught between the Nazi salutes at the Berlin Olympics and L- Joe Lewis knocking out Max Schmeling, which were all anti-Nazi Nazi pictures. And they, they, they are still iconic. I think most people would recognize those. In more recent times, the, uh, of course, the Vietnam pictures, we all talked about those at great lengths. They're iconic. There have, been some, there have been many, many great pictures coming out of the Middle East. Not in the volume of Vietnam, but there are some pretty pretty fascinating t- telling photographs i like the one uh, the girl in the green dress standing at the temple that was bombed and surrounded in the carnage incredible it's a terrible picture but boy that tells the story of, mm-hmm. of that terrible yeah, that stupid is... war that they were got involved in over there those are the that's right boat mm-hmm. pretty much what the moon the print on the the footprint on the moon does that make it or is that just too well that's an interesting question i know you guys have talked about that and the footprint yes i still like the picture of the guy standing on the moon who was not who was not the first man on the moon he's the second man on the moon but it's true it's true it, but it it's the man on the moon and it's the quality is there the, the first picture is a fuzzy <laughs> poor mm-hmm. television copy of a guy <laughs> stepping off of a ladder so you have to go with the others and i think and then you also have the the earth rise over the moon. Oh, the earth rise. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a good, more good iconic point. one. Good point you make. It's yeah. a one where you, you realize how small we are. That's right. And that was the first time we've all seen that. Exactly. Everybody saw that picture, that image for the yep. first time together. Yeah. Although, you know, you always see it horizontally. It was really made vertically. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we back As to, it came back to yeah, uh, manipulated they, images. Damn wire, <laughs> damn wire guys are always like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Hal. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, John, our producer, and my co-pilot, and Jason Tables, our engineer. And a special thanks to Matt Hill, Gabe Biderman, and Todd Vornkamp. Give us your opinions on Twitter at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. And please rate and leave a review on iTunes. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for joining us today. 